This panel will be moderated by Margot Gerritsen, Professor of Energy Resources Engineering at Stanford. She is also a co-founder and co-director of the international organization, Women in Data Science. Please join me in welcoming to C3E, Margot Gerritsen. Over to you, Margot. Thank you so, so much, Naomi, and, and welcome everyone to this panel discussion. I'm so excited to be here with four wonderful female colleagues and all of you in the audience. And we're going to be talking about the intersection of equity, energy, and data. And uh, I, I can't wait. I'm very excited. And I know I'm going to be learning a lot from my very esteemed panelists. We'll be here with Chera Bills, with Jessica Granderson, Noel Bakhtian, and Chin Ma. And shortly, I will introduce them to you. Um, we have an hour together. We'll spend uh, the first little bit getting to know the panelists a little bit better. You have their bios as well. So please have a read through that. Uh, they're all extremely accomplished and have very long uh, records of impact and contributions. Um, and after that, we will dive into some questions. We first will talk about equity, what we mean with equity in this context. Then we'll introduce energy, and then we'll go to the data questions. What can data help us with? What additional challenges will data actually give us? And, and how can we move forward? So I hope by the end of this panel uh, discussion, you will have a pretty good idea about outstanding challenges, about contributions that you can make, about what is possible and what is not, and get some really good messages also from this, uh, from this panel. Before we start though, I'd love, we'd love to know a little bit more about you and where you're calling in from or where you're from. So there is a little poll here to just uh, get you to interact as well. So look at your polling uh, underneath uh, at the bottom of your screen or scan the Q code and you can put in uh, where you're from here and we'll see the results uh, coming up almost immediately. Now, while we're waiting for that, I'm calling in today from Bend, Oregon. So if there's anyone here in Oregon, I'd love to, love to know. All right, well, can we see, can anybody, everybody see the results now? I'm assuming so. Okay, so we see that we're really all over uh, the US and also outside of the US, which is just wonderful. So uh, welcome everyone. Okay, so, um, We'll go to our wonderful panelists. And like I said, I will introduce each of them individually and we'll have a little chat about their current occupation and also their background. And I'd like to start with Jessica Granderson. So Jessica, welcome very much. Uh, you have a very intriguing title right now. You're the Director of Building Technology at the White House Council on Environmental Quality. And this council coordinates, so you've told us, the federal government's effort to improve, preserve, and protect America's public health and environment. So I'd like to ask you a little bit about that later, what that exactly means and what you do. But I do want to mention also first that you were actually a C3E 2015 Research Award winner. So you're back in, in home territory. Now, before you joined uh, the, the council, you were chief scientist and deputy division director for building technology and urban systems at Lawrence Berkeley National Laboratory. And you spent a lot of time working on energy management and savings initiatives of all kinds of different organizations, nation's largest enterprises, national accounts, public sector entities, um, as well as small commercial buildings. I particularly liked hearing about sensor suitcase, uh, which is an application that you've been uh, working in. Now we recently met uh, and, and I'm just delighted because I'm gonna be learning so much uh, from you. Um, but one of the questions I wanted to ask you here for the audience also to get to know you a little bit better. What does a director of building technology do? Well, thank you um, very much. Thanks to the C3E community for including me in today's panel. It was such an experience for me to win the 2015 Research Award. 
um, and just so inspiring all the great work um, being done across the board from the award winners, the ambassadors and the students. So it's really my, my deep pleasure to be here. Um, director for Building Technology and what do I do? Um, you know, in my federal capacity now, I'm working on the building emissions and community resilience team at the Council on Environmental Quality at the White House, um, looking across um, the mission, broadly speaking, to decarbonize the nation's building sector. And that's um, across all of our homes and businesses. Um, we work from the federal level to the state and local level and back again in coordinating efforts uh, to really bring a, a whole of government approach uh, to the climate crisis, um, spanning decarbonization of buildings into our justice initiatives. Um, in my capacity at Lawrence Berkeley National Laboratory, um, my focus is more on the R&D programs and portfolio, whether that's residential or commercial high-tech and industrial facilities, um, and our programs uh, from earlier stage development all the way into demonstration and deployment. So what is your biggest dream as director for, for building technology? What do you hope to achieve in your time there? Oh, my goodness. Um, you know, I really have uh, an aspiration, this is kind of a, a blend of also just my personal passions um, to see data really much more ubiquitously integrated into the delivery of low carbon climate resilient homes and buildings across the nation. And we really know that to do that effectively will require equity in all of its dimensions, uh, many of which we will unpack today across the panel's conversation. That's great. Thank you so much, Jessica, for joining us uh, today as well. Uh, let's go to Noel, Noel Bakhtian. Now, Noel and I go back quite some time. Uh, I, I know her from Stanford. She did a PhD at Stanford a long time ago, and, and she and I met at that time. And I'm just delighted to find her again so many years later uh, as, a, as a leader in, in, this, uh, in this field uh, at this intersection of, of energy and equity and, and data. She is now the executive director of the Berkeley Lab Energy Storage Center. Um, she is the founding executive director actually of this initiative. And this is a lab-wide center that wants to accelerate the translation of basic and applied research into real world energy storage solutions. She is also a board member for QSITE, which is the Institute for the Quantitative Study of Inclusion, Diversion and Equity. And QSITE leverages quantitative methods to reveal and analyze big data in support of grassroots organizations, and that all with a goal to catalyze systemic change. Um, she is also on the advisory council for the Duke University Energy Initiative, as she just told me that. So thank you so much, uh, Noel, for, for reconnecting and being on this call with us uh, today. Uh, tell us a little bit more about that big new initiative that you're setting up uh, in the area of energy storage and energy justice. Absolutely. Thanks, Margo, for having me. It's really a thrill to be associated with C3E uh, and just love the mission here. So uh, as Margo said, I am the executive director for this new center out of Berkeley Lab, one of the Department of Energy's 17 national labs. Uh, it's all about energy storage. And with this new administration's focus on uh, energy equity, energy justice, it's really opening the aperture uh, as far as what the national labs are empowered to do and, and what we could be doing in this space. And so um, I'm a convener, you know, in my roles at DOE and the White House previously, uh, that's, that's something that I've really enjoyed doing. So what we've done is we've created a new community of practice across all of the DOE complex, this 30 billion plus uh, annual investment in the national labs and uh, broader with headquarters to create, a, bring people together at the nexus of energy justice and energy storage so that we could be sharing best practices and how do you incorporate energy justice in research and development? How do you big build relationships with communities? making sure that we have a sense of all the research that's going on in this space, energy storage plus equity, and going a step further, identifying the gaps and the opportunities that exist 
so that we're, we're doing the right thing and, and accelerating this work as fast as we can for the benefit of the nation. Now you have a PhD in aeronautic, uh, aeronautics <laughs> and astronautics. And, and so it may be really fun for the audience also to hear about how you ended up where you are right now. That is a good story. Yep, my, my PhD is in aerospace in, in at Stanford. Um, and, and I was doing a lot of work at NASA at the time. And around the last year of my PhD, I was working on Mars landings and the administration decided to shut down the, uh, the um, space shuttle program. And so I was like, oh my gosh, how does government make decisions like this? So I decided to go off and do a year in DC to learn about science policy. Of course, that year turned into five years and I went from Congress to Department of Energy to the White House, but I really learned about science policy. And, and during that time, I started focusing on energy and environment and climate and firmly believe that climate is the biggest problem and biggest challenge of our, of our generation. So I switched from aerospace. Now I'm a climate person for the last decade. And every day I wake up uh, trying, trying to make a difference on climate change and equity is a big part of that. Yeah, so you, you, you go for climate rather than SpaceX. Here, I know. Great. <laughs> great, well, thank you again. Let's go to Chiara Bills. Uh, Chiara and I met each other quite recently and she had uh, gave this wonderful uh, seminar recently in my department here in Energy Resources Engineering. And one of the th reasons why we connected is because we overlap a little bit in some of the research that, uh, that we're doing and that's around equity in transportation. And I was just so impressed with Tiara that I thought oh, pe other people need to know about her. And, and so that's why she's here and thank you for accepting our invitation. She's uh, currently still an assistant professor in civil and environmental engineering at Wayne State, but she's soon moving to UCLA, also in civil and environmental en engineering and the Luskin School of Public Affairs. Um, before that, she was at Michigan as assistant professor and also a Michigan Society Fellow. And she worked as a research scientist at IBM Research Africa as well. Uh, now, Chiara investigates social impacts of transportation projects. She works to design transportation systems that provide more equitable returns to society and investigates individual and household level transportation equity effects. You have many different areas, public uh, areas of interest, uh, Jera, public transit, transit reliability, emerging data sources for travel demand modeling. And, um, and like, like I said, we have, we have some, some common interests here. Uh, one of the projects that I'm running is a transport and equity related project for Sonoma County. Um, so right, one of the projects that you're working on now looks at quantifying data error from underrepresentation of vulnerable communities and how they affect travel model predictions. And I find that particularly interesting. So tell us a little bit more about that, Jera. Yeah, so, so first and foremost, thanks so much for, for having me. Thank you so much to the, the C3E uh, community for uh, this invitation. I too think that, that there's a lot for me to learn um, from this community, so I'm quite excited about this discussion. Um, so, so yes, I have a couple of uh, different projects that are focusing in this area of quantifying errors uh, associated with um, collecting household travel data from uh, disadvantaged communities. These are low-income travelers, uh, disabled travelers, elderly travelers, um, travelers who in general uh, struggle to uh, access opportunities using the transportation system for a variety of, of complex reasons. And the reality is that uh, it's very challenging to collect representative data from these communities uh, because uh, of a variety of reasons um, and uh, reasons that we don't necessarily understand very well uh, in practice. And so uh, I've been looking into traditional uh, data collection strategies that are implemented at the regional level and uh, coming up with measures for characterizing how well these data sets reflect uh, the, the travel behaviors and uh, various statistics of, of uh, vulnerable communities. Um, and by and large, you know, what we're able to tell 
is that we're we're not doing a very good job. And it's it's something that we we sort of know in the back of our minds, um, but we still don't have very good uh, practices for that that would improve representation. And so this is one of the areas of interest. And then on the other side, um, it's really important to know sort of how far off we are um, in our predictions of travel behavior, given that we're, um, you know, we're applying models that ingest this data that does not reflect these groups well. And so if we're trying to understand how our systems perform uh, for uh, vulnerable and disadvantaged communities, um, it's important to know sort of you know, what, what the gaps are. And so if, we, um, uh, if we're able to sort of characterize this, then we can, um, you know, it can inform our decision-making going forward. And so, um, you know, one part of it is making sure we can collect better data. The other part of it is understanding uh, how poor data impacts our ability to predict behavior. Yeah, and, and we'll have some opportunity also later to dive a little bit deeper into some of those aspects that are so critical and that you've just mentioned. So now you've heard so far from somebody from government, we have national labs represented, we have someone from academia, we've heard about housing, storage, energy storage and transportation. So um, we really have a very wide and diverse representation here in this panel. And that gets even better when we go to the next uh, person, Jin Ma. Uh, welcome so, uh, so much, uh, Jin, to this panel, because you're representing industry also outside of the US and business opportunities also in this space. Um, so Chin works for Total Energies. I think you just changed your name, right? This company from Total to Total Energies. She's the founder and the managing director of the Asia platform at Total Energy Ventures, TEV. Um, and she's been with the company for 12 years. Her expertise is in venture capital investments, business strategy and corporate governance as well as sectorial experience in energy, mobility, and sustainability investments. You're really strongly embedded in the venture capital and the private equity ec ecosystem in Europe and Asia, and super interesting, I think, to quite a few people on this call as well. Now, Jin is quite a powerhouse. She, uh, for example, recently ranked fourth at the Global Corporate Venturing Rising Stars Awards for 2021. So congratulations, Jin. Now, Jin and I go back a little ways because she appeared in a wonderful panel uh, just recently in the Women in Data Science Conference earlier this year. And she and I got to know each other there and, and it was really delightful to hear you. I'm really interested in hearing from you a little bit more about how equity meets business opportunity. You know, you've made some interesting investments in your career, for example, in a company called Canopy Power. And I was looking at Canopy a bit. And one of the things I like is that they, they invest in and develop microgrids. Uh, and energy solutions for uh, remote areas and, um, and, and also, uh, uh, you know, disadvantaged communities. So tell us a little bit more about how, you know, how you thrive at this intersection in business of solutions that really put equity central and, and at the same time also seek these, these business opportunities. Yeah, thank you so much, Margot. It's so great to see you again. And thank you for the invitation. Honored to be part of the C3E uh, community. Um, as you said, you know, our day-to-day -day job is doing uh, investment in startups that is proposing the new business model or technology in the energy uh, mobility as well as sustainability field. And increasingly, I realized that actually uh, the, the data, the information, the digital means the, the, the sensors uh, jointly play a very important role uh, to actually uh, transform the energy landscape. And it's actually bring energy and mobility to a lot of uh, um, population that ha hasn't have access to those services before. And because those are normally very capex heavy industry needs a lot of government support. And so for a long time, it's difficult to bring them to some uh, faraway communities or communities don't have the uh, access or capacity to pay. 
But then with uh, with uh, the new digital solutions and data tools, those are possible. So you have uh, mentioned about Canopy. So Canopy is one of the examples that we have made investment in the company, in the startup. What they do is they, they propose a, a PV panel uh, as well as a battery solutions as a package with a remote control system and data analyst solutions so that they can actually provide micromobility as a package to um, communities that uh, um, does not have access to energy before. So that actually changed whole, uh, the entire story and, and people have access to energy. And with that, household can buy more electric appliance um, and they can start to do more business on top of that. And we just realized that it's actually a door opener for more and more opportunities afterwards. Uh, and some other examples are in the mobility field. We can see that uh, for some households, they don't have access to the public bus uh, bus uh, services uh, because it just doesn't justify the economic scales. But with uh, uh, again with uh, the, the data uh, and with a sensor and with a smart mobility solutions, it is possible to design an on demand route. Uh, to really specifically um, each time uh, adjusting with the demand and to, to allow these people to have access to the mobility. So we are very thrilled, thrilled um, coming from the energy industry. Traditionally, we see heavy capex investment in order to lift the people out of poverty have, have, and bring energy and mobility to these people. And we see that more and more opportunities are opened up, actually, digital and data opportunities to really helping people uh, to have access to those solutions. Um, and um, every day I'm very happy to, to work on this, this field and bring more opportunities, uh, not only commercially viable, but also um, serving an equity uh, cost in the act. Thanks very much, Jen. Well, you've heard a little bit about the panel members and you've seen that they cover a wide uh, range of, of areas of expertise. We'd like to hear a little bit more from you. So we have another poll. We'd like to see what field you're from. Are you a data scientist interested in moving into the direction of energy and equity? Are you studying equity? Uh, or are you maybe an energy specialist or a student? So please fill out the poll, same thing. Go to the bottom of your screen and select poll or scan the QR code and we'll get the uh, answers given to us as, as we go along. And as you're doing that, uh, what we're going to do next with the panel is jump into the question of how we all define equity. We've heard equity mentioned uh, a lot today. <laughs> I mean, the whole conference, of course, is about it. Uh, and every time you talk to people in a particular sector, they have their own views on how equity is defined. So we'll do that first. Then we'll bring in energy and we'll look at the nexus of energy and equity. And then towards the end, we'll bring in data. So instead of doing a data first approach, we'll do a data last approach in this panel. <laughs> And then we'll end with these questions about what can uh, you know, modern data science give us and maybe not give us and what challenges are open in this field. Um, so if we start looking at some of the results here, if you can put this up, uh, you see that uh, there's a wide variety of people in, in this audience as well. So that's, that's great. Thank you very much for that. So let's move to this whole question about equity. You know, when, when I work in, in, uh, this, on this transportation project, we think about equity as, as having many different facets. You know, uh, very often in what I see is when I review papers or when I hear people, they talk about equity as meaning equal access to benefits uh, of particular policies or, or other mechanisms or solutions that are put into place. We also look at burdens, uh, maybe uh, th very carefully thinking about what a policy of a new approach can uh, mean in terms of unintended burdens of, or additional burdens on, on particular populations. We also think about agency. Do populations or groups have the agency to control uh, whether or not they can reap these benefits or uh, can they alleviate the burdens that they may have additionally. 
uh, scale comes into uh, this as well. You know, what scale are we looking at equity? Uh, are we looking at marginalized communities in the region? Are we looking at this much more broadly in the world? So I'm really curious to see how each of you would define equity and how you have worked with that in, in your own projects. And I'd love to start with Jessica. Uh, Jessica, let, let me go to you and, and talk about what that means for you and, and mm -hmm. your council. <clears throat> Absolutely. Thank you. Um, we think about um, first a little context on um, the building sector and the role that it plays in climate and environment. Um, I certainly was surprised to discover at first that buildings are accountable for a good uh, third of our uh, energy related greenhouse gas emissions um, in contrast to, um, say, industry or transportation, which is where I think um, we somewhat more intuitive to think about the implications there across the country. We have um, well over uh, 100 million homes and some 6 million uh, businesses and commercial buildings that comprise the sector. And typically when we think of, there's so many dimensions of equity, I really appreciate this question because I feel like it's so necessary to really unpack specifically what are we talking about. Um, so in my domain, we could think about equity across the workforce, technology and service providers, um, who comprises that workforce, whether we have established versus up and coming businesses, demographics of ownership and staff as um, one realm to consider. We might think about um, rural versus urban issues um, that might have implications for things like data access, um, access to Wi-Fi, exposure to different fuels and um, different utilities that may be available. Um, third, we think about environmental justice and frontline communities um, where we see a convergence of, uh, say, race and income. And if we get back to the fabric of the buildings themselves, we can think about who's in them, um, owners, uh, occupants or tenants. Uh, class A versus uh, Class B type of buildings, or even the businesses that occupy them, maybe small versus large businesses and the um, resources that they can bring to bear in creating a productive, healthy, and safe environment that's actually benefiting the climate and questions of community resilience. Yeah, I, I appreciate you focusing on all these various stakeholders that you may have, you know, depending on what, what problem you're, you're hoping to address, which is really important. Noel, uh, let, me, let me go to you. You're looking at energy storage uh, solutions here. What are you thinking about when you talk about equity in that context? Yeah, well, you know, I think you hit uh, on a lot of them, and Jessica did too, access, burdens, agency, um, you know, representational uh, justice, et cetera. When I think about energy storage in particular, I think about like a, a range of things. One is one of the major tenets or the strengths of energy storage is we can help get more um, renewables on the grid, more solar and wind on the grid if we have storage to hold that energy when the sun's not shining and when the wind's not, not blowing. And what that means is that we can do away with some of these dirty power plants that tend to affect um, certain communities, the lower income communities who happen to be next to a power plant. So there's a geographic piece there. There's an income piece there. Another thing I think about when I think about energy storage is resilience. When we have these big storms or the polar vortex or wildfires or whatever it is that makes the grid go out, energy storage is what could enable like a microgrid or, or, or people to stay online. And that affects hospitals and other critical infrastructure like energy infrastructure. But also what we know is that a lot of times it's the poorer communities that have their electricity go out first. Um, and, and, and there's data on this. There needs to be more data that we collect on this. But on the resilience side, again, it, it comes down to income geographic and there's other factors as well. 
And then I'll just mention one more thing uh, that's energy storage related, which is the story about fast charging. So for those of you who aren't aware, obviously there's electric vehicles that are really taking off, which is exciting as we're, we're striving for a clean energy economy for, by 2050. Um, but right now it, it could take a few hours to charge an electric vehicle. Um, so what I, the way I heard it was that this concept of fast charging, so charging in the same amount of time it takes to maybe fill up your car with gas, came about because there was a recognition that there were certain communities that didn't have their own garage or the, the means of putting in their own charger. They didn't have time to sit in a parking lot, even if there was a charger available for a few hours, because they don't have a few hours because they're working, they've got kids, they've got the multiple jobs they're working, et cetera. So this concept of fast charging um, uh, has part of its foundation in, in the equity, the equity uh, conversation, which I really love. Yeah, Chiara, you know, when, when we uh, talked earlier, you mentioned various uh, uh, places where there really are severe compromises made in terms of equity in, in, the, in, in the transportation systems. Can you give us some examples of that to try to put this equity definition also in perspective? Right. So um... I, I spent a lot of time thinking about how to define equity. Um, and, you know, the, the, the definition itself, you know, they are, um, you know, these things, these goods that are distributed. And so they are benefits, they are opportunities, they are costs, they are, um, you know, a number of things. And um, the idea is that they be distributed fairly and, um, and also that we pay uh, close attention to what the needs are. Um, because I think that fair really means providing people what they need and recognizing that, that some people need more than others. Um, in terms of examples uh, in, in transportation, one, there's a long history of, of looking at uh, the fairness of uh, transportation benefits and costs, you know, dating back to the environmental justice movement, um, you know, dating it back to uh, original investments in the Eisenhower interstate system. Um, there are numerous examples of, uh, of, of uh, minoritized communities being displaced and made to be worse off in order to, um, you know, roll out the interstate uh, highway system, communities, uh, you know, being displaced, homes being taken away for right of way. Um, and these were largely low income black and minoritized communities. Um, and, you know, you don't actually have to go back 50 years, you can still see very clear examples today uh, when it comes to transportation opportunities, when we think about ride sharing uh, services and how, um, excuse me, ride sourcing, uh, when you know drivers are deciding where to locate and which trips to take, which trips not to take, um, you know, there's quite a bit of evidence that uh, these choices um, might be subject to racial discrimination. Um, and what that means is that you have for some uh, communities, uh, lower levels of accessibility to ride sharing, to ride sourcing um, in a systematic way. Uh, and, you know, this has ramifications for their quality of life, for their ability to uh, reduce their emissions by adopting more environmental friendly um, more choices, um, and also has long-term ramifications as well in terms of uh, our ability to quickly move to a place where we're emitting fewer emissions. Um, so, you know, so these are, you know, really important uh, examples to consider. I think, you know, to summarize, um, you know, when we're thinking about equity, we need to be thinking about the needs and we need to be thinking about um, how we can uh, incentivize uh, uh, provisions or solutions or innovations that will provide greater needs to those who are um, most vulnerable in our society. Thanks, uh, Chair. You know, it, it resonates so much with me what you're saying. And, and one of the things that um, uh, I, I've heard people say, um, but I don't always see in practice that when you think about equity, that needs to be front and center. That needs to be right there from the start of your solution design process and, and right at the end and all the way through. And 
in, in our meeting beforehand, one of you said so beautifully, you know, don't let equity get lost in during the process. Sometimes people start with equity at the beginning, they have all the best intentions, they work on solution approaches, but somehow it gets lost along the way. Um, sometimes also in, in solutions, you see equity come in as an afterthought. Uh, and, and there's a quick adjustment to put equity uh, uh, a little bit more uh, central uh, at, the, at the end of the design process. Jessica, I just wanted to ask you about this. You know, when, when you're addressing an energy problem and you're putting equity front and center, you know, what kind of approaches are you uh, using and how do you make sure that this equity piece uh, stays central? Uh, is the main, you know, the main, uh, most of the attention is paid to that throughout the design process and not just at the very start or as an afterthought at the end. Well, absolutely. And, you know, I think um, if, if we're honest with ourselves in thinking about the, the energy um, field at large, um, we don't necessarily have the the best playbook that's universally known on, on how to deliver in the ways that we would aspire to. Um, I can give, you know, one example of where I think this is coming up in a very um, compelling way in some emerging policy that we're looking at for building sector emissions and climate, which is in the development of building performance standards, which are new policy that address um, a minimum bar of performance for existing buildings throughout their life cycle. Um, this is a case where we have a very compelling opportunity to um, leverage requirements in a way that we can bring about material improvements across our stock across our you know, multifamily homes and businesses, but we quickly get to a place where we have to really dig in to figure out how can we really correct historic uh, underinvestment, increase uptake of incentives where they're most needed. How can we marry requirements with programs that will address poor condition and poor environmental quality um, and balance costs and benefits across stakeholders? Um, we don't want to just um, design policies that only the most resourced uh, can really comply with and then say, otherwise we will um, say slap you with a fine. And I think the way to do that is really to emphasize out of the gate early on in engagement at the community level in a way that we haven't necessarily done so well in the past to think about how we're bringing in um, workforce locally, um, interests of real estate, needs of uh, local um, programs and policy shops. I think this is a place where I'm very excited because I'm seeing these principles really begin to take hold um, and be delivered on the ground in a way that hasn't necessarily been present in our more um, pinpointed and siloed approaches in the past. Yeah, beautiful, um, beautiful explanation there. Uh, Jessica, thank you for that. It's time, I think, to bring data in. <laughs> we've been talking about <laughs> equity and we've been talking about the interface between energy and equity, but how does data come in? Can data help us? Is it is that uh, you know giving us uh, the possibility to generate solutions that be previously we couldn't uh, generate? And where is it not exactly helping us? What additional challenges with respect to equity does data actually bring up? And there are so many different facets to this. Uh, one of the things that we heard so far is that uh, stakeholder engagement is extremely important to understand the needs of stakeholders. So that immediately, of course, raises this awareness that we cannot just look at quantitative data, that qualitative data are also very important. Um, but there are so many aspects to this. And I'd like to go to Chin because you work at, at a large scale, you know, and you've been looking at solutions, data-driven solutions 
in very large areas of the world, for example, in, in Asia, uh, and mobility challenges uh, where you're really developing data-driven solution approaches or you're sponsoring companies that, that do make that, like Grab and, and other companies in, in this space. So what is your... What, what, what have you seen that really works at this intersection of data, equity and energy and solutions that you're very positive about and very optimistic about? Yeah, thank you. Uh, it's a really um, insightful question. Um, I think for data, definitely it is playing a very important role um, in, in the sectors that we are looking at. And uh, uh, give one example is... Um, Plastic, plastic recycling in, in India. Um, actually, plastic use a lot of energy uh, to be produced. Um, and, you know, data can just helping people, helping the, um, uh, the collectors, the informal collectors who earn a, a very little amount of money each day. And before they just spend their days earning very uh, uh, low, just uh, barely enough to, to survive their day. Uh, but with data, actually, they can be guided uh, to work on days uh, when there are more plastic to be collected. For example, there is festivals or because of the certain kind of uh, uh, weather conditions, there is less, less plastic to be collected. So they can be guided um, and they can also be guided to, to collect the best uh, uh, suitable kind of plastics. In, in, in that sense, the large quantity of data can actually um, extract a lot of valuable things to, to helping the people uh, before uh, who doesn't have all this uh, access to information, therefore doesn't access, have access to, to guide their activity to the most valuable added uh, parts of the, the value chain. Now it become possible. Um, similar for, for the mobility, as you mentioned, Grab, um, and it's actually possible for them to propose in some on-demand uh, bus services and some other on-demand uh, carpooling services that uh, to serve uh, communities that is otherwise not being uh, served. Uh, the same for energy access for the canopy because the data is possible, uh, capable of ass uh, um, assess the condition, the battery condition, the PV condition of the weather to forecast the energy. So it become possible to have some uh, a remote uh, microgrid solution. So it's definitely uh, open up doors for a massive amount of um, kind of solutions and uh, bring power to the people who is otherwise uh, suffered from the equity uh, before. Uh, but I think what is uh, need to be really thought uh, of and to be monitored is, uh, um, is, is there anybody else, anybody uh, being overlooked in the design of the data system? For example, there's a, a lot of business now is based on the data. Therefore, the mobile mobile network is very uh, helpful uh, for people to, uh, for example, run their own business, uh, buy a little two wheeler a scooter, and run run the passenger transport or logistic services. But this is on condition this person is uh, literate, can read, and can use the app. Uh, actually, some some community that is not able to read or elderly citizens actually are even worse than before because they couldn't have access to this new data solution. I think those are things we probably need to uh, carefully look at um, in the design of the systems and investors or governments can play a role to ask startups and companies to have a checklist, make sure that, as you said, in our region, those questions are being carefully thought of. So as investor, have you been on the lookout for companies that address a particular challenge that you think can be uh, advanced very well using data and you just haven't seen that yet? I, I know there are people in the audience who are really interested in, in uh, moving in this space and thinking about good startup ideas. So maybe uh, this would be interesting to hear. You know, what are you hoping for that you haven't seen yet, but that you're very positive and optimistic about? I think really a large quantity of data um, and uh, carefully um, engineered uh, algorithm uh, and assessment of those data can really make it possible for the whole system to be more uh, decentralized and cu customerized. Um, give one example, for example, the ammonia and fertilizer are a big uh, source of green greenhouse gas emission before, uh, which can create some climate disasters and actually impact the most, uh, of, um, 
most uh, unfavorable people in, in, the, in the world. But with large quantity of data, actually um, the soil data, the, the weather data, the air data, um, it's actually possible to design at scale, uh, commercially pi uh, viable, de decentralized system. For example, a small system with, with PV, with a smaller production unit locally on the field to produce a fertilizer tailor-made, customized. Uh, and this system become viable well before people couldn't e imagine because before it, everything has to be at scale to be able to uh, work because energy is a commodity, commodity you have to make the price uh, low and cost low. So that's where you know massive, massive opportunity can really be, be driven and value being extracted out of the data. Okay, well, if anyone in the audience is interested in trying that out, they can connect with you, Jin, uh, about this. I'd like to go to Noelle because she had another example of solar uh, combined with demographic data that uh, she is uh, quite positive about. Noelle. Yeah, so we actually have a, a big publication out about big data for solar and going back to um, really centralizing the equity equation. So they, they took data from about 2 million installed solar PV panels around, around the country on, on people's rooftops. And what they did is they merged it with demographic data and they started to look at, they're looking at the equity pieces of this. And it, it really takes people who, who are interested in, in honing in on that, or at least making the data available so that others can. But the, ver the, the basic story is there's a very distinct gap, as you can imagine, in e inequity and deployment of rooftop solar. But starting to look now at, at what can be done about it and having that concrete data is really helpful. But looking at the policies and is it, they're figuring out it's about the financing and how can we make the financing uh, easier and, and lower that. I also just wanted to mention that there's some interesting other ways you could you could be thinking about data for equity as well. For instance, we've got a whole center at Berkeley Lab that looks at lithium for energy storage and other uses. Um, and we're very involved with the Lithium Valley Commission, which is the California Energy Commission uh, that brings together um, the, the communities with the industry that's pulling lithium out of geothermal brines. Uh, and, and, and it's it's great because it brings the communities together. But what our team is doing is they're actually using the transcripts to code the community reactions to what's going on. So we can be more um, uh, responsive to what the community thinks. Other ways that we're working on this is we actually use natural language processing to look at how communities have reacted to other types of projects like this, mining or otherwise, across the world um, so that we can understand what the challenges are and be learning from those best practices because we don't want to just be starting fresh. So I just wanted to throw those two examples out there. Yeah, thanks for that. So when we think about data, you know, you all mentioned data that we can gather, data we can collect. We need to think about who does this, who owns that data. Uh, is the data that we're collecting useful? Is it really, is it really uh, reflecting what we're looking for, what we're after? Uh, and Tiara, I wanted to go back to you and, and talk a bit about that. Uh, uh, you, in your work, you've certainly encountered uh, uh, data collection challenges, uh, as as well as bias in, in data, um, and so I'd I'd love to hear your thoughts about the the additional challenges that data collection, generation, and data use for making decisions really bring when you look at things with a strong equity lens. Yeah, so I am. Uh, on the, I guess, on the um, second half of a uh, NSF grant where we are looking into um, how to collect uh, data using, um, you know, community-based approaches. Um, and that is uh, combining um, the implementation of things like mobile apps and online surveys uh, with traditional data collection, including uh, paper surveys, and also centering all of these um, around a, uh, uh, a community um, interface. And so uh, these are workshops that we, uh, we do, uh, and this is centered in Benton Harbor, Michigan, but you know, we, we've learned a lot of um, you know, interesting things, mostly about 
um, how uh, what the data tells us uh, may not necessarily align with how people actually experience the transportation system. Um, we learned a lot about uh, the different types of uh, barriers that might exist that that are um, they, they don't necessarily um, or they're not necessarily things that one would expect. For example, um, in these community workshops, we would have participants to come uh, ready to participate, um, ready to tell us about how they travel and what they think about the current transportation system. Um, and they would say, hey, here's my cell phone. You know, I'm ready to download this smartphone app, but perhaps the cell phone um, while GPS enabled uh, requires some updates. And so without those community workshops and being able to actually orchestrate the downloading of smartphone apps, uh, these are the types of people who would not be able to generate data. Um, you know, other things, you know, people perhaps being eager to contribute, but they don't have the appropriate eyewear to read the questions and understand the information. And so learning, you know, hands on about these types of barriers, learning about literacy challenges. Um, you know, there's a disconnect between people being excited about or wanting to contribute and being able to contribute. And so, you know, part of our, um, you know, that our study allows for us to highlight some of these things. Um, also, you know, just thinking about the nature of the data and that they reveal what people are doing. They reveal people's uh, preferences and how they make choices given some constraints, but we don't necessarily observe the constraints that they are, uh, you know, that are um, governing their choices. And so, you know, we call this, you know, this, this challenge with stated preference data, and that's the nature of the data that we have. Um, the, the data on um, that we get from, from Google and Streetlight and uh, AirSage and all of these different companies that basically take, um, you know, cellular traces and, and um, uh, um, you know, different types of uh, perhaps Google information or information from, um, from cell towers and produce these large scale data sets that tell us about how people are traveling. Um, you know, this is observed data, what people are doing under constraints. Um, I think that the challenge is that just because we observe people doing um, various things, for example, we observe them biking or we, exult, we have, um, oh, excuse me, we don't observe them biking or we don't observe them uh, using transit in a particular area, it doesn't necessarily mean that they don't want to. And so I think that we need to get to a place where we're actually thinking about the nature of the data um, and what is, what is telling us about behavior and also taking a look at um, or, or using other, as you mentioned, um, qualitative approaches to understand um, what the constraints actually are and trying to marry these various approaches to get at a true picture of what people are doing and, ask, and also what they want to do, if that makes sense. Yeah, thanks, Jera. You know, what, what is increasingly evident is that if you really want to put equity central, then, then the, the, the whole solution approach becomes very complex. Uh, very, very interesting also, very worthwhile mm -hmm. doing. <laughs> and we can really, really make great contributions, but you have to look at all aspects of this design process. You know, the data gathering, the data generation that you do yourself, how you measure impacts of any program that you're that you're uh, uh, suggesting as well, you know, and, and, and does it really do what you set it out to do? We've seen some really interesting examples of that. In, in the EV adoption programs, for example, in California, where the outcomes are not as as uh, as great as as uh, they were hoping when they when they started with these policies, so all these things are, are incredibly important, right? And throughout this whole big optimization problem, and some of the questions that have come in uh, from the audience relate to that sense of optimization also, and and balancing uh, that co comes into play when we're working on these on these very complex complex challenges. And Jessica, I wanted to go to you with, with some of the questions that are coming in from the audience. And thanks everyone for putting those questions in. It's wonderful to, to get them, so please keep them going. Um, one of them is, you know, how do we actually get 
better data. So we just talked about some of the shortcomings of data that we may have. So how do we get that? And here is a question related to getting better data on how low income communities use energy and, and how uh, they may get uh, increased burdens from surface shutoffs, for example, who benefits from efficiency programs in clean energy investment. And that seems to be uh, uh, in, in your, bulb, in your uh, neck of the woods, uh, Jessica. So I'd, I'd really like to ask you about that. Oh my goodness, what a great question. Um, what a way to get at you know, our, our aspirations as, as well as our pains as researchers working at the intersection of energy and data. Um, so this whole question of data access and availability and ownership um, is just such a pressing one. Um, who, who can get their hands on what data to solve which problems and how does that really drive um, the solutions that are emerging and being developed, I, I think is really something that we're grappling with. Um, we've many times been confronted with just not, you know, having a great idea for something we want to develop, but not really having the ability um, to access the information that we need. So I think here is where, you know, in my field, this is, there's, as in so many, you know, so much data locked up in um, either legacy systems or proprietary systems or with companies whose business may not be um, contingent upon making data available as a public utility. Um, so I think we have huge opportunities um, if we think across um, the private sector, uh, research, multiple levels of government to think about um, what problems are we trying to solve and how can we open up diverse data sets to be brought to bear in, in solving those problems. Um, some efforts that I personally have been involved in over the last several years are all around the development of open, ground truth, verified data sets that can be used to catalyze um, the development and innovation of new algorithms and software-based approaches to do just that kind of optimization of efficiency delivery um, and building operations. So I would... Um, encourage everyone who's interested in this to think about ways that we can work together and what are those partnerships going to be that will unlock, develop, maintain, and sustain um, the data pools that we really need to move the needle forward. Yeah, thanks. You know, one, one of the difficulties and challenges, and that's also why it interests me so much in this field, is that these energy systems that we're developing and creating or trying to improve touch so many different stakeholders in different ways. And so when you look at equity, uh, you always end up having to make choices, right? And, and this whole idea of how the choices that you're making contribute to equity or inequity <laughs> is a good one. Sometimes you solve one what you perceive to be strong equity problem to create another. And several of the questions by the audience are in, in, in that space, right? How, what does fair mean here? How do we balance uh, one stakeholder need versus another? And so uh, let me just go for some a final comment on that before we wrap up with, with your, your last thoughts and messages for the audience. To Noel, Noel, what's your take on that? Let's see. Quick take on that. You know, it's an important question. How you're collecting the data, what your metrics are, what, what characteristics you're looking for, what you know, how disadvantages is defined. This is all important, and it's going to make a difference in your final um, your final answer. Um, so I'll just I'll just mention an example. We all know that a lot of effects are nonlinear. Um, so so if you start to use averages, for example. Um, you, you could end up with a completely wrong answer. And so disaggregating data and trying to get it as granular as possible and showing you know, regional effects or, or, or whatever that is, is important. And so the example is there's a, there's a, a whole program um, and a tool at Berkeley Lab called BEAM. And I'll, I'll, I think if you just search B-E-A-M in Berkeley Lab, it'll, it'll come up. But, but Anna Spurlock, who's helping run this, um, has really... Been, been throwing out the point that 
the whole purpose of having an agent-based model where you literally are modeling little simulator people. You know, these are the agents making their own decisions and they're all imbued with their own characteristics based on census data or whatever that is so that you get a distribution of answers in a disaggregated um, way so that you can figure out what the distributional impacts are instead of just getting a, a single averaged answer, which could be completely wrong based on those no, nonlinear effects is really important. So I just wanted to bring that up. Yeah, thanks, Noel. Well, you know, this topic is, is so intriguing and complex. We could talk about this for many hours, but I'm hoping that the audience got at least a, a taste of all the different important aspects to it. And we're uh, very uh, close to being out of time, very quickly going around one word that comes to your mind now, something you want to leave the audience with, one word, Jessica. Uh, persist. Jin. Resistance. Noel. Hope. And Chiara. Oh, you're muted still. I'm going to cheat and use a phrase, change our way of thinking. Fantastic. Thank you all so much for joining us today. Thanks to all of the panelists. And thanks, Naomi and the organizers for having us on. <laughs>